What we basically found was that we could turn on and turn off tumor growth simply by changing the level of protein intake within that 5 to 20 percent range. To see something just like protein within that normal range that we actually consume ourselves just turn on and turn off tumor growth? Even when tumors are already present, we're not, we're not now talking about preventing too much. We're talking about tumors are already growing robustly. They're there. And we change the nutrient intake, the protein intake level, and we could switch off fairly late in the process. I mean, some viruses start cancer, like hepatitis B virus that kills the liver cancer. We could basically turn that on and turn it on off too, simply by changing protein intake. The specificity, that's where really things really kind of started heating up because in this case when we look use soy or wheat same level 20 percent it didn't do it i didn't talk a lot about it certainly not in the grant applications that i was getting and and so forth but this protein was casing cow's milk protein 87 percent of cow's milk protein and i've had quite a lot of experience with the agencies both in this country and abroad the united nations who look after deciding, you know, what's a carcinogen, what's not. And there are certain criteria that these folks follow. Criteria that determine when we decide a chemical is carcinogenic, if you will. The IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, if I apply those, that, that evidence, these, these, these criteria that's used by everybody else to decide what's a carcinogen, I have to conclude I, there's no other way, and I've given this seminar to professional audiences in universities about four or five times now with this chart. And I don't get any questions, I don't get any comments. Everybody sort of sits there and kind of stunned. But quite frankly, I have to say that casein, which I'm going to argue is reflective of a larger sort of body of evidence having to do with animal proteins in general, is a carcinogen. It's the most significant carcinogen we consume. Forget about DDT and dioxin and things like that. We're talking about animal protein. Extensive human studies in the, the 70s and 80s to the point that animal protein, in my view, is more hypercholesterolemic than a saturated fat. Certainly more than cholesterol itself. It's that significant. And there's lots of studies on that. Lactobumin is another protein in milk, for example. It increases atherosclerosis and other experimental conditions. It's really quite dramatic. It compromises vitamin D status and increases prostate cancer. Animal protein does. The consumption of dairy is the best predictor of prostate cancer. And how many people have heard this? It's just not getting out there. Somebody's, I, I don't want to say cooking the data, but they're controlling things. <laughs> you can see the animals fed the normal level, the 20%. They had a tumor index, if you will. That means numbers of tumors and the size of tumors and all that. 3,300 and some, the animals fed 5%, 248. In other words, huge difference. So we were answering the first question. This normal level of protein just turned on tumor growth. It's amazing. 12%, which is just above the level they actually need for growth. Even there, they were turning it on. But once you get below 10%, we looked at that, you didn't see really much any activity. Protein is required, by the way. It's, it's obviously an essential nutrient. But what we were basically showing was when we went above the level that actually was needed, that's when the problem started. And it turns on IGF-1, plant proteins decrease it, increases calcium bone loss. I mean, in other words, you start looking at the literature, you find this animal protein thing is really quite substantial. My sort of enthusiasm for this work has really come about because of the evidence in the research world that I've been involved with for now, gosh, 40 to almost 50 years, I guess, 40-some years. Who's controlling the agenda? That's what it's about. And it's something that's terribly misunderstood by the public. Almost no one really knows about this unless you've been in the boardrooms and sort of watched this kind of thing. And I served on a number of those expert panels myself, and I don't remember when we were doing that that we had that kind of support. We were using public money. Now the industry is coming in and sort of getting some money behind us. And yeah, I know it doesn't have any effect on all of this, but... Um, to say that 35% protein is okay, it's associated with a minim minimizing you know, chronic disease risk, I think it's obscene. I, I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> and the chairman is a, is a friend of mine, the chairman of that panel, Phil James. Uh, so they said 10%.
And here in the West, this came out just before the WHO report did. They said 30, 25 percent. So I wondered, how can a group of scientists, two groups of scientists, come up with these very different figures? 25 percent, you can go up to 20, or 10 percent? Well, it turns out, as they say, I don't know, maybe the MMRs did have something to do with it. The, the sugar industry gets on their high horse and basically are going and threatening the WHO report and the panel and said, get that thing, that 10 percent up to 25 percent. If you don't, we're going to go see Tommy Thompson. We got some friends in the White House. We're going to go to Congress and we're going to ask the United States to withdraw funds from the United Nations. That's what happened. And I don't know how many of you really know that, but they really did use strong arm tactics to try to get the, the United Nations panel to change their 10 percent level for added sugars up to 25 percent, like the United States did. I mean, we, we behaved. We, we did the right thing. We got up to 25 percent, you see. I come back to the protein thing just for a minute. I just want to um, show you how, how important this really is. I've talked about the 5 to 20 percent. And incidentally, let, let me say this, that the experimental animal work that I did, or we did, uh, experimental animals are like us animals. The amount of protein we require is the same as they do, and it's all sort of coincidence, about the same. If you look at the range of intake of protein for us animals, us humans, we range between 11 and 22 percent. That is, 5 percent of us are a little lower than 11 percent. 5 percent of us, you know, the weightlifters and stuff, some of the weightlifters up 22 percent. The amount that we, we've known for 50 years how much protein we need, we only need 10 percent. Our average intake is 17 percent. We're somewhere between 11 and 22. And nobody hardly goes above 22. Now this esteemed body is coming along and telling us we can go up to 35. You know, welcome Atkins. I, I could go on and on about this, but I won't. Especially since the chairman of the Food and Nutrition Board is now the director of the division of which I'm in at Cornell University. <laughs>